The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining our Sands at Mike talk for this evening, especially for those of you on the East Coast later in the evening, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, perhaps uh, not a big uh, problem with respect to when you're joining. So glad that you're able to join tonight for a conversation that I want to have with you around 10 visibility gaps that every CISO must fill. And really excited about uh, this topic, uh, for a lot of experience that I've had at leading large security teams and areas that I've found and things that I've learned that can be applicable uh, and appropriate for you on your journey. Um, again, privileged to share, fun to create, a lot of real world examples. Speaking for myself, uh, really happy to be able to share this uh, topic with you this evening. So the first thing is why these gaps? Okay, there could be a number of things that we could focus on here. The thing that I wanted to spend some time on was applying what I believe was the best advice I've ever been given in my cybersecurity career. Uh, and that advice came to me from someone who had nothing to do with technology. Someone who had nothing to do with cybersecurity. I even said these things before cyber was a buzzword that we like to use and throw around and that advice was this, and, and I want to share that advice with you. That advice was get wisdom as cheaply as you can. Get wisdom as cheaply as you can. This idea of how can we learn lessons from others and avoid the pain, the suffering, the battle scars that come from, well, just life happening to us. How can we learn those lessons better is really uh, what I uh, uh, got in that advice and areas that I like to share with you to think of ways that you can uh, better understand, better get some of this wisdom without you having to learn many of these the hard way. So yes, a lot of these uh, gaps that I had in place were ones that I had challenges with myself. Uh, the setup that I have uh, for each of these 10 things in no particular order, so not an order of importance, but this idea of what is the gap? What is a what I hope you found is a clever, maybe cute way to remember that gap? And then finally, a critical question paired with each of these gaps so that you can ask along your journey, uh, whether it's now or in the future, you as a security leader, questions that you could ask to have better uh, understanding of what's going on in your respective security program. Are you ready? Well, here we go. The very first one that I want to talk about today is the visibility gap of your compliance requirements. We all have to serve somebody or somebody's. Uh, more and more I see uh, folks that I'm privileged to teach with SANS Institute. I talked earlier today, I uh, had a great time talking about uh, leadership, security leadership in particular, uh, all day long today. Clients that I consult with and do work for, uh, it's more and more common that there's many different compliance requirements, not just one, but a series of compliance requirements. When I think of compliance requirements, uh, it makes me think of, well, I'm based in Atlanta and not too far from me in Atlanta is a amusement park. And the amusement park is Six Flags Over Georgia. And at Six Flags Over Georgia, they have some safety requirements. And those safety requirements say, in order to ride rides that do like what it shows here, a picture of a roller coaster at Bush Gardens, uh, in order to do, uh, get on rides like that, there are certain requirements that have to be met. You have to be a certain height. You can be taller, you just can't be shorter because the risk to yourself, the risk to Six Flags Over Georgia, Bush Gardens, Disney, all those places is just too great. I think of compliance like that. Compliance says don't do any less than these things. Don't be any shorter than the requirements that we have for you if you're in the, uh, as a merchant credit card processing company, payment card industry. PCI says don't do any less, don't be any shorter than doing all these things if you want to process or store or transmit credit cards. Healthcare information, HIPAA says, from privacy, from a legal perspective, make sure that you do these minimum things. You can do more things, just don't do any less things. And I think about compliance uh, that very same way. I can do more if I want to, but I'll probably get in trouble 
maybe I'll be put in the penalty box if I do less than what's required of me. So the question I have for you, the critical question that's outlined for this first gap, this first visibility gap that every CISO must fill is, and it's going to be rhetorical. I recognize the environment, the time of day, and the medium that we're using here. I'm going to ask the questions, and feel free to put questions in the uh, questions box if you have any questions, but in this case, it's going to kind of be rhetorical. I'm going to ask this question, and you can think about it. You can contemplate, but the question here, uh, we think about Six Flags Over Georgia Ride that I mentioned earlier, is, is your company tall enough to ride? Is it doing the minimum requirements at least? And perhaps you'll do more than what you have to do, what someone else makes you do. This idea of how do we make sure that we're doing the known good things? Some companies, some organizations, it might take a while. There might need to be a strategic plan such that in a few years that you could answer this question in a positive way. Maybe the better question would be, okay, in these places, are, are there some of these requirements that are so good and necessary and can help us? Maybe we'd want to answer those questions more frequently, more often uh, than what we would normally have or see in place as well. So different ways to think about this particular question based on where you are, based on where your company is, and the goals that it has in place. So you ready for the next one? Here it is. The next gap is visibility gap of your security tools. I bet you, I just bet you, you've got a whole bunch of tools that monitor things and alert things and block things and do things to help give you a sense of, uh, dare I say, assurance that you're doing all the right things, whether for compliance or security assurance purposes, lots and lots of tools out there. Uh, remember what you put in the business case that you made. You made a memo, maybe you made a business case that says, the reason we need to have that security tool is, and you outlined all those requirements. It's going to make us see things faster, alert us to when bad things happen, we'll be more secure when we have those tools in place. And it, maybe you looked at that, and maybe you helped build that case so that senior leaders in your organization could say, yes, let's go get that shiny new object. We all need to have shiny new objects. But how do you know? It's really doing what you expected. What assurance do you have that that tool is still doing the things that it's supposed to do? What would it look like to be able to have assurance and have visibility into how the tools are working uh, and how it's actually doing that? What do you, th how are those tools doing? What would it look like to have, let's say, a dashboard? a dashboard that showed us maybe the status of our agent health, of all the security agents that you have out there, all the tools that you have in place, what would it look like to look at one source, one pane of glass, or one part of your security operations center wall that said, here's the status of all those agents. You have them, you paid for them, they're supposed to be deployed, they're supposed to be out there working, but sometimes we hear in breach investigation reports that the controls we have in place, the security tools we have in place, oh, it wasn't updated, it was out of date, it hadn't phoned in in a while, it's just not quite working. We've got the belief that it's there, but oftentimes, oftentimes we find out that, oh, it wasn't working for, for whatever reason. It was supposed to work, we wanted it to work, it just was not doing so for some reason. So what ways, what would it look like to have a dashboard, a piece of visibility to let us know how well our security tools are actually working? That's really what we're wanting to look at. And so here's that question. Are your security tools, your security tools, all your security tools providing their intended value? Are they checking in? Have they been a while? Would someone even notice if they hadn't phoned in in a while? Think about a metric, and I challenge you with this. Maybe after 24 hours of not phoning in or not connecting to the, say, the mothership or to the central management console, maybe, just maybe it should be someone's job, maybe not your job, but someone's job to ensure those 
devices, those applications, those agents are phoning in, getting their updates, sending their alerts, and letting us know what's happening. The rhetorical question I like to ask, and I asked it like four times today when I was teaching uh, SANS class earlier today, was this question. How long can you stand to not know there's been a change in your environment? How long can you stand to not know? Your agents haven't phoned in. You, they haven't done their in, intended function. They haven't phoned in in a while. How long is that? Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's a day. Maybe it's a couple of days in that territory. I get a little nervous, but maybe being able to know in a couple of days would be uh, a great uh, improvement for you. That's okay. Take where you're at and you want to make it better. That's really what we're looking for here, just making sure that you're getting the intended value out of the tools and the technologies that you have deployed already. Making sure it's complete, it's thorough, and they're doing all the things that you told them to do in their respective policy. Next, the next visibility gap that all CISOs should have is the visibility gap of their strategic plan. You've got to have a strategic plan. Strategic plan that says a full recognition, a full accounting of all the tools, the technologies, the policies, the people, the risks, the risk registers, the audit findings, the regulations, all the things that say the current status of our information security program is, and you as a leader being able to answer that. You as a leader being able to fill in that gap to describe what's in place, what level of maturity is there, what, how can we make sure that we are confident in being able to correctly and articulately state how we're doing. But I know you, and if you're anything like me, you want to say, you know what, I think I can do better. I think that we can take the capabilities that we have, dare I say, even take credit for the other security decisions before you became a security leader even join that company to say taking credit for what's in place and using that and talking about the momentum to describe a future state that says I'd like for it to be better. I've been to the future. I've seen a time when we have higher levels of assurance, a team larger addressing the current risk that we have, talking about what it looks like to achieve the goals of your strategic plan and then in your plans, in your projects, in your objectives, in your working papers that, you're, that you have and you communicate with your leadership teams to say, here are the work streams, here's how we get there, here's how we make our vision become our reality. That's what we have with our strategic plans. This idea to say, where are we? Are we on track? And would we know if we were off track? Hey, when I'm looking at my calendar, it says that it's July 27, 158 days left. Now, certainly everything has changed. Everything's been turned upside down. Everything's been happening to us. Uh, the last several months have been a challenge for each and every one of us. It has been for me. I know it has been for you. Has your plan needed to be adjusted? Has, was there things that you planned on doing this year that for lots of good reasons now need to be changed or modified? Now's our chance. If that's necessary, Totally understand that, totally get it. What are ways that you can start to communicate that if you've not already with your leadership teams, with your security teams, with those that you're privileged to lead of whatever adjustments need to be made uh, and, and make those adjustments and move forward. And if they need to stay the same, again, when you wake up tomorrow, 157 days left to do whatever it is that needs to be done. So looking at what level of visibility do you have with respect to the things that you have committed to do, to achieve, to work on this year. Great opportunity for you to put on something very simple, like a recurring calendar alert. Maybe at the last Monday of every month for the rest of the year, just a reminder of how's our plan? How are we doing against it? What adjustments need to be made? And how can we make uh, when the end of the year or the end of the reporting period that you happen to have in your organization be uh, more likely to be successful in you achieving the goals and your respective strategic plans. That's what I want for you. How would you know that? And so the question is really that. 
when's the last time you checked on not my plan, but on your strategic plan? When's the last time you looked what changes need to be made, communicating those to your leadership team, to those you're privileged to lead, and what types of triggers can you set up to start asking these questions? What can you be doing as a leader to help remove roadblocks for your teams? Those that you're privileged to lead who are depending on you to, when they come to you with problems, come to them with some solutions so that they can continue on the projects and programs and initiatives that are in your strategic plan. All right, speaking of team, hmm, here's one, the visibility gap of your team. This is really a question of engagement. When I led large security teams, when I've been a security team of one, I've always thought of this question of, a question of engagement. Am I doing things that only I can do? And that's not saying I'm better than anyone else because I'm not. It's not saying I'm worse than anyone. I think I'm just the average security person, average security leader, no, no issues there. But what I recognize, especially in a leadership position, my time is fixed. I've only got the same number of hours a day, hours a week to contribute. And for me, as someone who grew up in the ranks, I mean, I started as the juniorist member of the security team, that was successful, got increasing responsibilities, and again, very privileged to have served as the chief information security officer and chief information officer as well. Fun, interesting, stressful lifestyle. But the higher I got up in the org chart, the more I realized that there were some things that only I could do. And as tempting as it would be for me to go and respond to an incident or be the chief of the incident handling team or uh, give someone advice on their compliance requirements, I could do that and I've done that and I've been successful at doing both of those things. When I do that, that's opportunity cost. When I do those things that I used to do, it means it's kind of cutting in on the time and the margin I'm able to take it, take care of those that I'm privileged to lead. That question of engagement, am I doing thing, only things that only I can do? And that's actually a question I have of myself and a question I've asked of those on my security leadership team. I want them to ask that as well. On the way to work, ask that question. What are some things that only I can do that if I don't do them, they won't get done. And if they don't get done, my team is going to I uh, wish that I had, or even dare I say suffer, because I did not do those things. And on the way home every day, of course our commutes are different now as they used to be, but on our way home today, whether maybe that's for me going from downstairs in my basement where I'm at now to going to upstairs to the main level to check on my family, maybe at that moment, how much did I do the things that only I can do? Things such as taking care of the team, asking them questions, what can I do to help? How can I help them uh, to be all that they can be in their career, in their journey to become the very best security leader they possibly can become? And there's one thing that I did, and again, this was one that we may have to uh, modify a little bit in this moment. Uh, for those of you that are still working remote, and I know some of you, working remote through the, at least through the end of the year. Some of you may have already started back to work and, and I can totally respect we're all over the place with respect to uh, are we yet going back to our respective office. When we were in the office, a test that I gave to my leaders was to do what I called the cafeteria test. Now, it's something I totally made up. I've not heard of someone else doing something like this. If you've heard of something like this, let me know and we'll, I'll give someone proper credit, but I think I came up with this. This idea of when I'm going into the cafeteria, I've got my tray, I'm gonna get my food, and I see someone off in the distance, and they see me off in the distance. And then based on my reputation for helping them or, well, not helping them, when they see me, and in that millisecond before they realize that I see them back, what's their response? Do they say, oh, there's Russell, he meets my needs, he helps take care of me, 
he doesn't always give me what the answers that I like to have, but he understands my business area. He's helpful. He's a big, good colleague and good partner to me. Hey, Russell, how you doing from a distance? Or when they see me, do they say, oh, no, I'd rather, I'm just going to sneak out of here. I'm not going to even be around because the reputation of Russell is he's going to say no, and I cannot do the things that I want to do. And he slows my business down, and it's not helpful, and, and it's not helping me anymore, and I don't like that very much. What's your answer to the cafeteria test? When you show up, the reputation that you have and those that you're privileged to lead, how they engage with colleagues in your organization, do they want to come closer to you or do they want to pull back and say, oh, I need, I'd rather just leave and have them not see that I'm even here because of our reputation. And that's things that you can do as a leader. You can promote that. You can coach mentor, lead, guide your team in that direction to just be aware and have that extra self-awareness to see how are we showing up, how are we, if at all, delivering value to our key business stakeholders. You can, you can do that, but again, that's in those areas of what are the things that only you can do. And so the question then is, what is your team working on right now? And in a specific way, who are they helping? Are they staying at their desk? Are they log looking at their screen, answering emails all the time? Or is there a particular time, even in this moment right now, where maybe every Thursday at one o'clock, they have a recurring, poem, a recurring appointment to reach out, to ask questions, to engage, to speak English, to speak business with other non-security members on your team? and in your department, and in your division to help them understand the key areas in the business, understand the functionality uh, that's in place, understand why the business is in business. And those are ways that you can help to do that, uh, and help to engage and help to show up in those ways. So that's the question there. What's your team working on and how can you help them uh, to do that? The next one is kind of a, perhaps a cousin of the previous one is the visibility gap of your culture. When I was recruited to start a couple of jobs ago that when I was working at a large financial institution, they said, hey, Russell, come work here. This will be great. You have a great team. We've got a cool mission. You'll get to do some things you've never done before. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But tell me about the culture. Well, I like to be there. Will they like me when I be there? Uh, is that something that I want to be involved with? Or maybe where I'm at right now, my couple of jobs ago uh, organization, maybe, maybe I like it there because I know how to show up. I know the culture. I know how everything's worked there. And that was one of the questions that I asked. And maybe one of the questions that you've asked when you've done a job search or got uh, tempted by some um, company to go join their team. Looking at the culture, what's it like to walk the halls? What's it like to now go to all the Zoom meetings? Zoom meeting fatigue, I've heard uh, that statement over of what is that like to just be constantly back to back to back to back to back to back to back meetings? And, and is that really what we want to do? Is it, is it necessary? Are all those meetings and conversations the way we're having them now uh, really as uh, significant and important uh, as what they uh, seem to be. What about the culture on your team? What's that like? Is it competitive? Is it supportive? Is it helpful? Or right now, is it hurtful? Are you, is your team doing the things consistent with its mission statement that it has? And hopefully it has a mission and a vision and values for your security team. Is the behavior that you've seen even today or even last week consistent with that? Or is there incongruence? Ugh. We say that we want to be respectful to each other, but in the meeting, my team leader is always mean to me. He, doesn't, he or she doesn't look out for me. He or she doesn't help me achieve the goals that I want to be able to achieve. How do we think about that? How can we perhaps as a barometer see how that's working, see how that's going, and look for ways that we can assess, 
triage and especially as a leader say hey wait a second you know just as a reminder here's our mission here's our vision here's our values here are the things that we've held ourselves accountable to and for whatever reason we've drifted from that and it's time to be recentered for the benefit of those that we're privileged to lead how do you know that how do you assess that how can you by design intentionally as a leader go in and check and when necessary have some difficult conversations when necessary take up for uh, the person who's not as strong technically as what you are or doesn't have the confidence uh, that you have to me that's totally okay when uh, you know questions like you know how do you lead uh, someone who's technically stronger than you with confidence well the thing that I mentioned earlier, you know, I started as a very junior member of a security team and worked my way up. At the time, I developed skills, I got certifications, got very involved, got very technically um, uh, comfortable with certain tools and technologies in place. And as I became a leader, as I got more responsibilities in leadership, I lost my technical edge. There's a good reason I don't have domain admin access anymore. There's a good reason I don't have local admin access anymore because right now to do my job, that's not necessary. But what is necessary is recognizing that there's people who are smarter and faster and have more skills around automation and new ways of thinking, that, and they're better at the job that I used to do, but now their responsibility uh, is to do that. So in a leadership position, one of the things that we need to do, of course, is to recognize, uh, sometimes, uh, and oftentimes it should be that others on your team are more technically adept at you, with you as a leader, that's how it needs to be. That's how it should be. Now you can coach them, you can give them stories, you can tell, talk to them about ways uh, to have a greater enterprise view, but that's one where uh, I believe uh, that's actually what you want to have in place in a way that you can lead, recognizing that they may very well have more technical skills of your organization. All right, so the question with that is, What's the culture like in your organization? What's the culture like in your team? And how can you on purpose by design check in on that and have an occasional um, assessment of how well is it? If it's good, celebrate it, cheer, uh, do things to uh, improve, do things to celebrate that. And when it's not, it's not if, but when it's not, what are things that you can do to address? Things that only you can do to address and improve your culture. The next gap is the gap of your brand. How do you show up? How do others experience you? A fantastic book that I read uh, last year uh, was called Influence Redefined by Stacy Honke. I'm actually looking at it at my bookshelf now. Hanke, H-A-N-K-E, the book name Influence Redefined. And in it, she's an executive coach, does a lot of keynotes. She actually actually done some TED Talks. And this idea of how do we show up, how do we deliver our message, and how do people receive our message? And the advice uh, that she has in her book, she says, you know what, you think you're a good speaker, you think you're a good leader, you think you're good at communicator, you think you can run a good meeting, you think you're really good at all these things, but how do you know? And the challenge that she gave, and this is a tough one, uh, you may or may not love this one. I didn't love it the first time I heard it. The challenge that she gave in the book was, if you've not recorded yourself in the last month and made yourself listen to your conversation, you have no idea if you're a good communicator or a not so good communicator. So, wow, that, that's tough, that's hard. It's hard to go back and listen to recorded video or recorded audio of conversations that you've led or meetings that you've run or presentations that you've given. But that's what we're speaking to here is how do others experience your brand? How do others experience your brand? Here, looking at ways, different audiences. You as a chief information security officer, you as someone who aspires to be a chief information security officer will undoubtedly get to versus have to go and brief your board of directors or your senior leadership team. 
what's been fascinating is the for the last several years, Alan Powler and John Pescatore, two senior leaders uh, at SANS, matter of fact, Alan is running SANS and the owner of SANS, he has done some studies, he and John have done some studies with security leaders, security executives and boards of directors, interviewing before, during and after the chief information security officer went to the board to give a briefing. And the idea of you know, what do you think is going to happen, what did happen, how, it, how did what happened resonate with you. And what's fascinating about that is the conversations, some of the conversations that they had with board members after the CISO left the room. What's fascinating is what they talked about. As soon as the CISO left the boardroom, they're thinking good, oh, I get a pat on my back, my boss will be so happy for me for doing so good, but when the doors close, what do you think that the board members are talking about? They're talking about me, and they're talking about you, and they're saying things like, is Russell our guy? Is he the person to lead our security team, or did he confuse us again? Did he talk about acronyms and things you don't understand? Did he talk about the same things, or is this something different every time? And we're not quite clear where he's at and where he's leading the security team. How do we know this? Highly encourage you to take a look at the SANS archive webcasts. You can go to RSA, has YouTube uh, channels. You can look at, you if you type in Alan Powler, John Pescatore, uh, CISO briefing with the board or something like that, you should be able to find that and see the talks around the questions they discovered and the insights that they gave. And when I heard that talk many times, I've watched it many times, briefed boards of directors many times, and I always go back to how can I show up in a way that they can understand, um, in a way that is meaningful and useful and helpful to them. So, next, the question that we have here is what's it like to be on the other side of you. How do people experience you as a CISO, as a director, as a supervisor, as a team leader, as an individual contributor? How do people, how do you show up and how are you experienced? Lots of different ways to measure that, lots of different ways to look at this and be able to better determine how you're showing up uh, to the benefit of your leaders. So, next the visibility gap of your peers. We're a little bit over halfway done. Uh, we see a couple of questions in the, in the question window. I've asked, answered a couple already. One of them is the slides will definitely be available uh, probably tomorrow uh, on the website. Uh, we'll be able to upload this archive presentation and the slides will be there. So those are coming. Totally will uh, make those available to you. So that one uh, taken care of. The next one is around the visibility gaps of your peers. Visibility gap of your peers. Do you know local peers? Do you know people in similar industries, maybe in the same city, maybe in different places, friends you meet at conferences, back when we got to go to conferences, I know that things are kind of on virtual uh, conferences right now, eventually we'll be able to see each other again, eventually we'll be able to travel again, eventually we'll be able to get back to some sense of uh, community and fostering community in ways that don't involve Zoom or Teams or WebEx or GoTo training or all the other technologies that we have. What are you doing to cultivate relationships with people that do what you do, but do it at different companies? How can we get that wisdom as cheaply as we can? Where do we find that? Where do we find our peers at, especially now in this moment? How do we do that? Well industry events, either online. Security B-Size has transitioned many of those either online or uh, canceled, canceled those events. But since they're online, now you don't have to go and travel around the country to go to different B-Size events. The ones that are online, you can attend virtually, attend remotely uh, with the chat and Discord and Slack and other technologies to communicate. Maybe you can start to develop and nurture those relationships even now and not have to wait until we get to travel again. Depending on what industry you're in, you might have a local ISAC that you can be involved with, ISAC, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. 
I've been privileged to work in financial services. So I was very involved in the FSISEC or Financial Services ISEC. When I was in communications before that, heavily involved, very involved in communications ISEC or comms ISEC. These information sharing and analysis centers for critical infrastructure. I think there's 17 that the that DHS has defined communications, financial services, electric, power, healthcare, et cetera, energy. They have communities where after our lawyers can get together and agree to share threat information or share intel information or share indicators of compromise information, then we can literally have security teams at competing companies partner, share, and get wisdom as cheaply as we can. There's got to be someone who does what you do at another company that would love to get to meet you and love to get to share with you and love to get to, you know, once the lawyers are happy with it, once the lawyers say, yep, you can do that, be able to share information back and forth on a formal or informal basis so that you don't have to learn the same lessons. When I was in communications, that's exactly what happened. Lawyers for a very competitive market of telecommunications from Verizon and AT&T and Charter and Comcast and the list just goes on and on and on got comfortable enough to allow the security teams to share openly information with each other. Why did that happen? It happened because when you're running similar infrastructure, similar training, similar humans to defend those networks, when something bad happens at one, the odds of it happening at another communications company are very high. And the lawyers agreed that we could share information to see what information can we learn from each other, what information can help us be um, this uh, being able to um, share this information uh, successfully. Who's doing what you're doing at other companies? What connections can you make? What can you share with them in a formal or informal community to make sure uh, that you're able to answer questions and get uh, responses that can help you be the very best leader possible? Things like what vendors are being used. Hey, did you, do you use vendor so-and-so? Do you use this vendor? Have they been happy? Have they made you happy? Have they met your needs? Or after you signed up and paid your fee, have they kind of moved on and forgot about you? What about people that you might want to hire or have join your team? Might be other ways to ask questions just like that. And so the critical question is, how many CISOs are on your speed dial? And I'm gonna get personal with this deeper question here. If I could pick up your cell phone right now and look at your recently called list, Who'd be on that? Are there enough? Have you talked to someone who's doing what you've done this week, last week, last month, last quarter? And are there ways for you to make a connection even now in this moment to offer out help for them as well as to reach out for help whenever you need that help? So make sure uh, that we're doing that, make sure that you're connecting on purpose, building relationships, understanding and getting wisdom as cheaply as you can. The next visibility gap is that around your budget. Your budget, as a financial steward, as a security leader, oftentimes you're responsible for the budget of your team. Salary, training, trinkets, travel, uh, all the things that need to be done to finance the operation of your information security team. Why do we know what that looks like? What are the kinds of questions that we want to see? What does the language of business, the language of business is looking at what's shown on the screen here, money. What trends do we see in our budget as we look back from a historical perspective? Maybe it's not you that does this as a security leader. Maybe it's a project manager or uh, another member of your team who's very good at finances and helping you understand that better and communicate that, but looking in that, and just as we do for threat data, just like we do for intrusions and incidents and virus outbreaks that we might have, how good of a financial steward are we? Are we worthy of being trusted of the budgets that we have? Are we able to communicate how effectively the trade-offs that we need to make? Hiring training, budget growth, threats, incidents, time that we're working, a comp time that needs to be uh, given first air incident response team that are working over the weekend or working through some challenges 
or working on uh, different issues that are occurring. How do we know that? Where can we learn that? How can we figure this information out? Strongly advise, strongly recommend, and I've seen success personally in my career as a result of doing this. Find someone in finance. Find someone who works in that area of budgeting, finance, corporate stewardship, strategic planning, whatever the department names might be, and say, hey, I want to understand my budget better, but I don't know how to get that information. I want to not have that happen to me, but I want to be able to look, have understanding, pull reports, understand generally what that means, and be able to uh, respond when it's necessary to adjust things, to spend more, to spend less, to be a good financial steward in my company. Can you help me? How would it look like to help me? Is there anything that you can do to give me a greater insight, greater visibility into those areas? So, who can help? How do you know? Who can you trust? The question for you is, what metrics can you use with help, with coaching, with folks from finance who know finance as good as you know cyber? They're experts in that area. Who can you reach out for help? Who can you reach out to to help you understand, communicate, have access to making sure that your department, that you're privileged to lead, that your department, that you're responsible for their budget are being a good financial steward for the benefit of your organization? All right, next, as we're starting to wind down these gaps that we have in place, wind down these gaps. Uh, looking here, uh, one that I want to speak towards here is the visibility gap of your time. I mentioned it earlier. Did you catch it? What are you doing? What are the things that you're doing that only you can do? Do you remember when you started at your current job, that first day, you just got your email account, you just got your username and password, you just got law logged in, there was nothing on your calendar, and you thought, wow, how awesome is that? No meetings to go to, no boss, no status reports to do, no TPS reports to put out. I can do anything I want to do. And like four minutes afterwards, you got bored, and then after a while, your calendar started filling up. Didn't have time to go to lunch. Didn't have time to go to the bathroom. Didn't have time to do the things that needed to be done. Maybe you were double booked. Maybe you were triple booked. I've been quadruple booked in the past. That's just crazy. You physically can't do that. Why people send you meeting invites when your calendar's blocked out and they're not available, I have no idea. But it happens. What are the things that you're doing that only you can do? As you wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, what are three things that have to get done? Three top priorities that support the goals, your objectives, things that your boss has asked you to do, things that you're responsible for that your busy calendar won't let you do because it's just back to back to back to back Zoom fatigue. What are things that you can make sure that you're doing to make sure that you're only doing things that you can do. How do we avoid that opportunity cost? Realizing that as we spend time in one area, or spend time in one meeting, or spend time in one task, we are saying no to everything else we could have been doing at that same amount of time. We can't get nine o'clock to 10 o'clock this morning back. It's gone, we've spent it on something already. Whatever we did, if it was a meeting, that means we didn't get to work on a project or a report, or on automation, or taking a class, or attending a SANS webcast, or an, a SANS at mic talk like you are right now. You said no to everything else. As you think about that, what are some things that only you can do? What are three things that you can do tomorrow? That if they don't get done by you, they just won't happen. But maybe as a security leader, there have, you have people you have team members, you have colleagues depending on you to do those things. What are those things and how can you, as you close out your day tomorrow, ask yourself and do an assessment of the time I had, the eight hours, although maybe it's 10 hours, maybe it's 12 hours that you're working these days. I know in this moment, a lot of us are working 
a lot more uh, than we're accustomed to for many different reasons. But when you start your day, plan what are the things that only I can do. As you end your day, each and every day, as you end your week, each and every week, what's the percentage of how I spent my time? Did I spend my time doing things that only I can do or not? And the first time you do that, the first time you do that, you're not going to really love your answer, but perhaps you can start chipping away, meeting by meeting, project by project, status report by status report, to carve out some time, to have some calendar blocking. A technique I got from a dear long-term friend and fellow SANS instructor, Ted Demopoulos, this concept of calendar blocking that says you know, every day or every Tuesday at 10 o'clock till noon, I've got a re recurring appointment with myself. And that's time that I'm gonna work on projects that I need to do. I'm gonna do things that allow me to make sure that when the end of the year comes and my boss is gonna say, Russell, what did you do for me this year? I want to be able to say to him or her, here's what I did. I don't want to say to him or her, hey, I went to 4,000 meetings. I was on 92,000 conference calls. Isn't that great, boss? Isn't that why you hired me to go to meetings and to go to conference calls and answer Skype messages and uh, respond quickly to teams? Well, of course they don't want that. We need to do those things, but not only do those things. Find ways like calendar blocking to make sure that you can guard time to get to do what is called deep work to help make sure that you're focused on things that matter and when you're positioning yourself for success at your end of the year evaluation, your boss is going to be happy and delighted at the work that you're doing. So with all that talk about your calendar, here's the question. You know, I can't see your calendar. Uh, the job I had before my first CISO job, that's actually uh, the a question I got from my CISO at the time. He said to me, he said, hey, Russell, if you were CISO, what advice would you give to me, the CISO? And by the way, I'm your boss too. I said to my boss, as you know, I can't see your calendar, but if I could see your calendar, I would say, how much time are you spending in the department as compared to how much time are you, our CISO, our executive in charge of cybersecurity, spending in other people's team meetings and other people's departments and other people's uh, offices and conference rooms, spreading the good word of cyber to them allowing us in the department to work on things, to fix projects and do things that need to be done. Are you, sir, doing things that only you can do? And I ask that same question of you. I can't see your calendar. I don't need to see your calendar. You need to see your calendar and ask questions. What does it look like? Is there margin? Is there any slack space? Is there any time that you can maybe say, hey, instead of going to that status meeting, can I just not go if I commit to looking at the meeting minutes and if there's something that involves me or even the agenda before the meeting, if there's something I need to be a part of, I commit to being there. But otherwise, I'll just read the minutes. I'll just read the email instead to save some time to do the things that only I can do. Next thing I want to talk about is your visibility gap of your growth. And as it turns out, this is our last gap. This is gap number 10. Again, not in any particular order, uh, but things that I want you to be aware of, things that I've learned in my career of leading very large cybersecurity teams, asking myself questions, learning lessons, and hoping that you can get wisdom as cheaply as you can. How are you investing in yourself? Really? Well, for those of you in the East Coast, it's awesome that you're spending, you know, here it's 9.20 p.m. my time. Normally my, I'm about winding down, going to bed, but had the opportunity to spend with you this evening. So what you're showing me is that you're concerned about your growth. You want to grow, you want to learn. Maybe you are, or you want to be, or you aspire to be a cybersecurity leader, a CISO someday. Awesome, good for you. Let me know when you get there. If you've not already, I will be your biggest fan. I will be a biggest cheerleader for you in the role that you have or want to have in the future. That's awesome. Question, besides being here, besides being listening to me for the, almost the last hour, what's the last thing you did to grow intentionally? Are you learning? They say that leaders are readers. For me, four years ago, I had a goal to read 12 books in a year. 
That was a goal I had. And why do I have that goal? Because every year before that, except for when I had to, like for school or for studying for an exam or certification exam or something like that, I didn't read anything. But I heard someone who I admired said, leaders are readers. I thought, hmm, I'm a leader, but I'm not a reader. So I gave myself that goal. And I read 12 books. And the next year I said, you know what, that went so well. I learned so much. It exposed me to new ways of thinking, both from cybersecurity and in business in particular. The next year, 24 books. And I'm staring at you. You can't see my cameras. I don't. I'm staring at this huge collection of books that I want to read or I have read, things that I'm allowing to speak into me so that I can learn and get wisdom as cheaply as you can from cyber to business to career growth and development, to coaching and mentoring others that I'm privileged to lead. Those are the things that I'm working on. Podcast, oh, now that I'm not commuting to a full-time job anymore, I'm doing a consulting business and teaching with Sands more. I don't have an hour each way to commute to work anymore, so I'm, I've got a backlog and things I want to know, and I don't have the margin I used to have to listen to and have those speak into my life like I had before. What are you doing? What's on your growth plan? What are the things that you're doing on purpose? Very famous author, very famous leadership guru, John Maxwell. I'm looking at several books of his I have on my bookshelf. He said he's written 80 books. I heard an interview with him last week, written 80 books. Amazing. He said that young in his leadership journey, a mentor to him said, John, what's your growth plan? And John had to admit after stumbling through a, a horrible response, he said, I don't have one. And he said he committed to himself that day to have a growth plan, something intentionally and by design, he would be able to grow on purpose, learn things, grow, develop impact and influence people literally around the world at this time. And it all started with recognizing he didn't have one and recognizing he needed to get one. The truth is the leader you were last year is not the leader that your company needs this year in this moment. And it's not the leader that your company will need for next year. Whenever all things of all the crisis situation is, is uh, behind us, it's a story that we talk about. It's a point in time we refer to the leader that your company needs in that moment is not the leader that your company needs in this moment. What are the things that you're doing to grow and develop yourself on purpose? The question, how are you becoming right now the very best chief information security officer in the world, the very best security leader in the world, the very best in the world? What are you doing to invest in yourself? What are you doing to grow yourself really? So in summary, the gaps that I talked about, here's the order that I talked about them around visibility gaps that every CISO must fill, your compliance requirements, looking at your security tools, your strategic plan, your team, the culture, your brand, your peers, your budget, your time, and your growth. That's really the areas that I want to talk about and areas I wanted to focus on. There's my contact information. Again, we're going to make the slides available to you very quickly. Happy to do that. There's my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm going to look over at the questions that we have in place now. And if you've not, if you had any questions and wanted to ask them, feel free to do so now. Uh, one of them says, wow. It says, uh, wow, good for you. It says, actually, it's 3.20 in the morning. I actually announced right, 3.23 in the morning where you are. And glad to be on this session for an aspiring and future CISO. Wow, now that, my friend, is dedication. Bravo. Uh, amazing uh, priority to you. That is uh, fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Uh, visibility gaps are great. Next question, how can the gaps be measured? And more significantly, are the metrics that can be shown to your management chain and the board? That's an area, that's great. And I think what I'll do is, I've given this talk a couple times. Maybe what I need to do is build upon and add the metrics to them, more specific things, not just for questions for you to ask, but measures and metrics that you can use to communicate that. So thanks for that feedback. I'll definitely do that. Uh, at this time, it's more questions for us, us leaders or us aspiring leaders to ask each other. Uh, it's not yet been one, although you probably could take these and turn them into measures and metrics 
Uh, that's something that I don't have now, but thank you for that that uh, question. All right. Look for any other questions. I don't see any other questions. Um, thanks everyone for spending time, especially for those of you early, early in the morning, almost 3.30 in the morning. Uh, that's amazing. I uh, really enjoy spending time. Thanks for investing your time, uh, spending the time with me. Any questions, any issues, any challenges, anything I can do to help, by all means, send me email. There's my email address. I love Twitter. I love following a lot of folks on Twitter. Look at who I'm following. Maybe you want to follow them. Maybe you want to follow me. I'll follow you back. Stay connected. Be safe out there. Go spend time reconnecting with your friends, family, loved ones, uh, and uh, have a great night. And thanks for spending the evening with us here at SANS. Talk to you later. Thanks so much. All right, thank Jessica. you. Oh, thank you. Thank you to our speaker, Russell, for that great presentation, which helps brings us content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. <laughs>